Appreciate you coming. This is our third informational session in a three-part series. Welcome. We're honored that you're here. My name is Ryan Mullins, and I have the privilege of leading the Prairie View team. And before we get started here, I'm going to go ahead and do about a handful of introductions. These will be people that uh, you can mingle with after the meeting as well. If you have specific questions that might be relative to uh, their specific department responsibility. And so I'm going to go ahead and run through a list of some of those. Uh, David LaPointe is a gentleman in the back. He is the director of campus operations here at Prairie View. Um, we also have the executive director of Great Hearts North Texas, Mr. David Dent right here. And yeah, if you guys are standers, give us a wave when I introduce you. We also have... Ms. Stanley, who is the director of the Athenaeum program here there at Irving, and she'll have a ton of uh, questions for you as well, some, as well as some information there in the back. Mr. Patrick Malone, right here, he is the regional director of operations, also responsible for North Texas. Uh, let's see, we have Mrs. Youngberg, who is from the Irving campus. Uh, she'll be happy to answer any kind of questions relative to uh, classroom, uh, mechanics, things like that, and she'll talk a little bit towards the end of tonight's session as well. We also have, I don't think, Mr. Scott's not here yet, is he? Yeah, he'll be here soon. We have Mr. Scott Purdy. He's going to speak as well towards the end of tonight's session. Uh, he is a parent of Great Hearts students, and so he'll have some great insight into how Great Hearts has supported him and his family. He'll be here as well. Uh, we have Mrs. Diane Jones, who's the Director of Special Services. Wave to the director, there she is. And then we also have, I tell this guy all the time, he has the coolest name, Romeo Michael, who is the Regional Director of Special Services over North Texas. And so all of these individuals will be available afterwards if you have specific questions as well. Um, and then during the Q&A portion, we also might call on them for their expertise from that standpoint also. Um, for our agenda tonight, um, Mr. David Denton will come up and talk a little bit about the philosophy of Great Hearts, which is a very important topic and a very important conversation to have. I will come up and speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, go into a little more in-depth onto the curriculum, what you can expect here at Prairie View. Um, we'll also have Mr. Patrick Malone come up. He'll talk a little bit about enrollment, all things relative to the lottery process and things of that nature. And then we'll have Mrs. Youngberg come up. She'll talk to us about life, uh, a day in the life of a first grader, a third grader, a kindergartner, which is very, uh, that's always very fun. And then Mr. Scott Kearney will come up and talk to us from a parent standpoint. And then afterwards, we'll do a short Q&A session, taking all of your questions and giving you as much information as possible um, so that you can see what we're about. Uh, we're very excited to be here, very excited to offer a classical liberal arts education to the parents of North Texas. And so we'll go ahead and introduce Mr. David Denton, who is executive director over in North Texas, my boss, and uh, he has a lot of great stuff to talk about. So, David. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. You're too kind. Thanks, everybody. Um, Can you all hear me in the back? Okay. Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Mullins, for inviting me to join you tonight. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. We're very honored by your presence uh, and so glad that you are here with us. My name, as has been said, is David Denton, and I am the Executive Director for Great Hearts here in North Texas. I've been with Great Hearts since 2010. Uh, moved my family from Fort Worth to Phoenix, which was the only place where Great Hearts was at the time. Uh, stepped in as a dean and uh, math teacher, uh, then moved on to be a headmaster of a lower school, and then uh, five years ago moved into the executive director role, and two years ago was fortunate enough to be able to move back to my home uh, country, my, home, my homeland, Texas, um, and my students are now uh, you know, enrolled in uh, Great Arts Irving. Tonight, we're going to share with you our vision for K-12 education, our curriculum, pedagogy, philosophy. You'll hear from me, from Headmaster Mullins, from many others, as has already been, have already been articulated. And then we'll open the floor for questions. But before I dive in, I'd like to begin by asking you a few questions for your reflection. 
What brought you here tonight? What are you ultimately seeking for your children? What kind of man or woman do you want them to become when they grow up? At Great Hearts, we aim to raise up young men and women of virtue, steeped in knowledge and understanding, shaped by conversation with the great thinkers of the Western intellectual tradition, endowed with a sense of purpose, of destiny, and equipped to live it out. This is the essence of a classical education. Put succinctly, our mission is to cultivate the hearts and minds of children through the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. Our students, no matter how young, are in possession of full personhood, heart, soul, mind, and body, all of which are growing and in need of nourishment. We set our sights on forming the hearts and minds of our students by feeding them a rich and abundant course of study in all that is highest and best from literature, poetry, art and music, science and mathematics, history, and in time philosophy. They will not only study, but they will hone their skills in each of these areas. They will act in plays, sing in both winter and spring concerts draw and paint, memorize and recite, compose essays, mathematical proofs, and laboratory write-ups of their own. They will play and form friendships at recess, twice a day for the lower grades, and they will grow stronger and more confident through PE. In time, they will be able to enjoy all the trials and triumphs of team sports. In short, they will have every opportunity to grow and flourish in academics, the arts, and athletics, so that they may come to love not only the attainment, but the pursuit, indeed the struggle, to obtain what is of lasting worth in this world, the true, the good, and the beautiful. So for us, it's not about test scores, educational reform, new buildings, or balance sheets. It's not about creating 21st century innovators or critical thinkers. It's not even about getting kids into college, not ultimately. All of these things are of course important and rest assured that our students are excelling on standardized tests from third grade to third grade star all the way through the ACT and the SAT, uh, the most recent uh, data on the 550 plus graduates that we have is that our SAT score is 200 points above the national average. But these achievements are secondary to, indeed, the byproduct of the patient, intentional effort to form the souls of our students through the shared pursuit of all that is ennobling and excellent in this world, delighting together in the discovery of what is true, good, and beautiful. What does this look like in practice? Well, for starters, we hire great-hearted people, men and women who are morally, intellectually, and aesthetically alive, and who are up to the challenge of modeling virtue for our students. Then we pour into them continually for the entirety of their career with us, beginning with weeks of training before the school opens, and continuing with weekly professional development, regular observation and feedback cycles, network professional development days, and the opportunity to pursue advanced degrees. And then our faculty sets about sharing and discovering the world, its history, its nature, its thinkers, artists, poets, with their students, drinking deeply of all that is noble and good. They'll watch butterflies emerge from the chrysalis, ride with Julius Caesar as he crosses the Rubicon, Extract DNA from a, from a strawberry. Recite Paul Revere's ride. It takes a good six minutes. Cheer for Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel. Unravel the mysteries of long division. And they're going to read lots of good books. A Bargain for Francis, Little House on the Prairie, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Where the Red Fern Grows. 
That one's a tough one. We haven't read it yet. Because we agree with Charlotte Mason and Edie Hirsch that a child's mind craves a rich and varied diet of ideas, stories, and knowledge from all intellectual domains. This is how best to nurture their mastery in literacy, to increase their sense of wonder and depth of inquiry, and to form their intellectual, their intellect, and ultimately their soul. It is also how we prepare students to one day read the great works, Shakespeare, Dante, Homer, Euclid, Virgil, Dostoevsky, the Book of Job, the Constitution of the United States, on and on. We give students a deep first reading of texts that formed Western civilization, the books that constitute the great conversation. Our curriculum is content rich and our approach is rigorous, yet gracious, infused with the love and joy of our teachers. We are rigorous because we aim for mastery, not merely familiarity. We hold a high bar for our students and we come alongside to help them over that bar. I did not get this education when I was a student. In fact, when I went to college, I was so fed up with AP literature, uh, with the AP literature courses that I had taken, that I didn't even want to read books anymore, and so I got an engineering degree. But my calling was to teach. And when I, leaving cubicle PS2-3-K115 at Dell Computers in Austin, Texas, returned to the classroom as a high school math teacher, it was my good fortune that our faculty dean was a classicist. That summer, during in-service, we spent a week working through a text called Boethius, and it changed the trajectory of my career and of my life. I found myself saying during that week, I had no idea a book could do this. I didn't know a conversation about a book could be like this. Through one man named Brian Smith, I discovered the classics, classical education, and my new calling to help broaden and expand the reach and impact of classical education to the fullest extent that I could. I later moved my family to Arizona to join Great Hearts, and it was a great joy for us to return home to Texas two years ago. As I was saying earlier, my oldest four now attend uh, Great Hearts Irving. And it's a privilege to serve this great mission. And now it is my pleasure to call back to the podium to present the founding headmaster of Great Hearts Prayer View, Mr. Ryan Mullins. If you've never read Boethius, uh, the Constellation can do that to you. So uh, <laughs> it's a phenomenal text. If you've never read it, highly recommend it. Um, one of the flows of tonight, what makes David's uh, information so valuable, is the flow of tonight really goes from philosophical down to the practices. And so we start with Great Heart's overriding mission. I'll talk a little bit about the liberal arts, and we'll continue to get more specific. We'll talk a little bit more about the actual curriculum that we use in the uh, classroom, and then we finish off with a teacher and a parent. So we go from broad philosophical ideas down to the more specifics. And it's that way on purpose because a lot of times, you know, when people talk about uh, liberal arts, classical education, and even great hearts, um, you know, they tend to think, okay, what's the curriculum in the classroom? What's the curriculum in the classroom? Which is important, but what the curriculum in the classroom does is reflect the overriding presuppositions of what we believe about the philosophy of the disciplines and what it means to be a human being, which is precisely what David just talked about. What does it mean to be a human being? Is it simply we put data in, get data out, is it about data manipulation, make good test scores, go to college, make money, and that's the good life? Or is there something more? Is it that human beings are really composed of a soul that needs to be cultivated and shaped by aspiring to something bigger than money, or things, or more money, and more things, and more jobs. 
And at the end of the day, that's the essence of what Great Hearts is about. That's the essence of what Prairie View will be about. And so I'm assuming that's probably what brought you here today were some of those very questions that David mentioned. Um, I want to go ahead and mention a few things real quick, some, some just campus specifics. The Prairie View campus is a little bit different as far as a traditional Great Hearts launch. Typically, a Great Hearts launch would be in a permanent location. They'll build a phase one building and they'll open K through seven typically. For many factors that come together, uh, the Prairie View campus, uh, my team and I, we get something a little different, which is great. That'd be fun for us. Uh, we're gonna open in a temporary location and we're gonna open K through three. It'll be about 210 students total. We'll have two sections of kindergarten, two sections of first, two six, uh, sections of second, and about a half a section of third, a total of about 210 students. That will be year one. We will open in August of 2022. Now the very next year, year two, our permanent site will be ready to open and we'll go K7, K8, we'll see kind of what the dynamics let us do. And then we'll add a grade each year thereafter so that after five or six years, we'll be a full K through 12 scholastic experience. We'll have the fine arts, we'll have the music, we'll have the sports and that type of thing. And so it's a little bit of a different launch. The uh, temporary site literally is about two blocks up the road here. It used to be, I believe, an old Montessori preschool. 1750 Roof Snow Drive is the address it's right up the road here. And so, um, I think I've mentioned that in a couple of the virtual sessions, but I wanted to mention that again just so that everybody understands the dynamics and the flow of what the Prairie View Campus, what that will be like. Um, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily have that in my script, but I'll tell you a little bit about, about myself real quick. I heard David mention it. I thought, well, maybe I should tell them a little bit about myself. I'm actually new to Great Hearts. Uh, typical uh, progression for a Great Hearts headmaster is to start probably in a Great Hearts classroom work their way up to a dean, and then to an assistant headmaster, and then to a headmaster. I'm a somewhat rare out-of-network hire for headmasters. I don't know how many we have. So I've been in Texas a total of four months. Never been to North Texas, and some of you guys probably might not like this depending on where you're at with football. I'm actually from Oklahoma. <laughs> Let it slide. Now, thankfully, I am not an Oklahoma graduate, I'm an Oklahoma State graduate. I don't know if that makes it better for you. And so for 20 years, almost 21 years, I was a teaching head of school at a private classical school. And um, what brought me down here, people think, okay, so what brought you to Texas? You've never been here. Um, and sometimes the idea is if you're in a private school, that that's the good life. The problem is this, is to really embrace the liberal arts tradition, as well as my personal faith, there's a main theme, a main thread that runs through that, and it's called brotherly love, or being civically engaged, is what the Founding Fathers called it. My problem, after 20 years of being in a private classical school, was I had walls built up on this great thing called a liberal arts education that I gave my life to, and I believe it still answers all the key questions for humanity. The problem is, I was behind walls and very few people could get behind that. And um, I tell David, Great Hearts was looking for me perhaps for eight months for the, for the job, but I was looking for Great Hearts for five years. And so my, my wife and I, and uh, my one daughter that we have remaining at the house, I have five children, they're all older. Um, I have a freshman daughter that's early upper. We uprooted our entire life and came down here for a calling for a vision and for a passion. And so I'm extremely blessed to be here. Sometimes that journey is nice to hear because when I talk about a passion and a vision and something that I think about almost 24 seven, I don't just say it so parents think, oh, it's a good education thing to say. I truly believe it um, through and through. And that's what brought me to Texas. Um, and I did, by the way, enjoy the OSU Texas game a couple of weeks ago. If you're, a I'm a big football guy, so I did enjoy that. Um, let's go ahead then and get into. David had had talked about the the overall umbrella of Great Hearts and a philosophical kind of a touching of what that looks like. We want to move into here a little bit about the liberal arts, and um, 
you know, it's a 20-minute survey as we get into it because we could be sitting here for hours just talking about human flourishing, for example. We could be here for hours talking about the liberal arts education. We could be here for hours probably talking nothing more than about Singapore, for example. So we still hit some of the high points, but we want to get a little more in-depth um, compared to what we've done with the virtual information sessions that we've had in the past. Again, each session getting a little more specific. I want to make sure that you're aware of, there are some resources out there, if you haven't been at, at the tables, there are some resources out there. Um, there are some, there's some great information, curriculum overviews, um, some uh, enrollment information as well, so make sure that you hit those tables out there. There's a lot of great information out there that will be helpful to, to, for you. Um, so let's go ahead and talk real quick about the liberal arts. Uh, a great hearts education is an education in the liberal arts. And as we go through the next 15 to 20 minutes, um, we'll present some topics, but we'll also have to define some terms because in today's culture, we have some terms that don't mean the same thing as what they used to mean. And the word liberal was probably the first one that comes to mind. And so the first thing we want to talk about is the actual traditional formal you could say the, the word breakdown, if you wanted to, of the word liberal. And so when we talk about a liberal arts education, a liberal arts education comes from the Latin, which simply means uh, liberty or a free person. And I feel like sometimes when you talk about the liberal arts, you have to start with the definition of that word, because in today's polarized political climate, you say the word liberal, and immediately we get things like left-right politics or conservative, uh, conservative liberal public policy, and that's not what the word liberal means relative to a liberal arts education. So when we talk about here at Great Hearts a liberal arts education, we're talking about an education or what the ancients would call the arts that shaped and formed a person who could be free. Or liberty is what you and I would call it. So the liberal arts education, there's actually seven liberal arts. Um, they're composed of the trivium and the quadrivium. The trivium, there are three of them, and the quadri uh, quadrivium, there are four of them. What's kind of funny is I don't know how many people here graduated from a liberal arts college. Um, I'm currently, okay, yeah, I'm currently, I won't put you on the spot and ask this question. <laughs> So I'm currently connecting with faculty, uh, recruiting for next year, and uh, so we get a lot of uh, a lot of graduates from liberal arts edu uh, colleges. And I always ask them, without being, you know, I'm not trying to be a punk, but I'm like, do you actually know traditionally what the seven liberal arts, what they are? And even though most people graduate from a liberal arts college, very few can actually list what the seven liberal arts are. So the trivium, uh, we're not going to get too deep in this because we don't spend a whole lot of time into it. Uh, the trivium, basically there are three of them, and the trivium just simply means the three paths of mastering language. And so uh, in, a, in a liberal arts education then, the trivium was to shape students to be able to create with language. We hear a lot about creativity, and sometimes David had mentioned an engineering degree. We hear a lot about creativity and education, creativity, creativity. I'm always thinking, if we're really serious about creativity, a liberal arts education makes a lot of sense. Because it was literally formed to create free people who could create with language, the trivium, and also create with number, the quadrivium. The quadrivium basically is the four paths of mastering numbers. In that would be things, for example, the scientific uh, community, natural philosophy is what Aristotle called it. And so when we talk about a liberal arts education, we're not just talking about an education in the humanities, which a lot of times in today's, especially post-secondary education, when we talk about a liberal arts education, usually it means something like, oh, I got a humanities degree, which is not what the liberal arts education is at all. It has just as much to say and just as much work and just as much shaping in uh, scientific observation and in the command of numbers. And any freshman at, at uh, a Great Heart School that suffers through Euclid can understand that. I don't know how many of you guys actually learned geometry from uh, Euclid himself. 
Um, I did not have this education. I'm like David. I did not have this education. I came into it kind of back ways. But my daughter is a freshman at Great Hearts. And so she comes home all the time wrestling with Euclid. A real, a real education and being shaped by the master himself in numbers. It's phenomenal. Let's keep going. So a liberal arts education um, has to do with the mastery of language and the mastery of numbers. Designed to create a young person, designed to sculpt a young person, to be able to create in both of those. One author put it like this. Uh, he said, really what the liberal arts, well, what it really is, is two eyes to perceive truth and harmony in the natural order. And those two eyes are the eyes of language mastery and the eyes of number mastery. One of the things that the liberal arts does for us, and that you'll hear a lot of times uh, here at Great Hearts, we talk a little bit about it, even just in the definition of the liberal arts. One of the things I love philosophically about what it does is in today's culture, we like to pit these binaries, these, these dichotomies, these different philosophical, uh, what we would call opposites against one another. For example, a lot of times people say, well, I'm a language person, I'm not a number of person. Or things uh, like there's the philosophical and then there's the practical. What the liberal arts education, what it really does is it brings these two concepts, many of them, it brings these two concepts that we would think has some tension, it reconciles them together into a unified whole. For example, we mentioned philosophical and the practices. The practices in the classroom are rooted in the Great Heart's philosophical beliefs. To not understand the philosophy is to have practices that are impoverished. But in today's culture, we hear professors and we hear politicians and we hear people say things like, well, it's about philosophy, I'm not into philosophy, I'm into practices. You have to have both. And so the liberal arts helps to reconcile a lot of those dichotomies that we think are opposites. The liberal arts education blends these, it reconciles these two types of concepts. Now then, let's go ahead and get a little more specific into uh, our curriculum, our instructional program uh, here at Great Hearts. And so we'll move into uh, a, a quick curriculum survey. We'll start with our ELA, our English Language Arts Program. Um, English language arts, so poetry, literature, uh, grammar study, all those types of things. Um, these are things uh, that would be included in an ELA program. Um, the purpose of an ELA program is we want to develop eloquence. In other words, the ability to articulate and express ourselves with clarity. And we also want to develop piety. Now you kind of have to define piety because people kind of get a, a, a connotation about that. Piety just simply means respect and honor and love for one's tradition. If you looked up its formal definition, that's what it tells us. It simply means to respect our tradition. Doesn't mean the tradition's perfect. Doesn't mean we can't add to it and improve. But that's what our English language arts program is designed to do. Now then, at the foundation of that English language arts program is our phonics. We have a phenomenal phonics program. It's multimodal. It uses hand motions. It uses kinesthetics to go with it. So we have movements with these young people in addition to being systematic and being explicit. We teach explicit phonics here at Great Arts. Explicit phonics simply means this. Number one, it's systematic. In other words, sequence matters. And the second thing it does is it specifically attaches to length, it specifically attaches a symbol to a sound. So when we talk about Great Hearts, we teach explicit phonics. Explicit, we don't just say it just out there like it's kind of popular. It literally means that the sequence matters. In other words, how we present it, it's systematic. The order makes a difference. And at the same time, we teach that the symbol has a sound. You guys still with me? Am I communicating okay? We're always worried about time. I don't want to keep you here. I want to be respectful of your time, so we'll pick it up a little bit. Okay, our arithmetic program is next, and so we teach Singapore. Singapore has a really a natural flow to it that's very special, and there's a lot of things I get passionate about are Singapore mathematics. Um, the flow of Singapore, it works with students from concrete to a pictorial, a picture of things, and then to the abstract. 
the thing I love probably that gets me so excited about Singapore mathematics is this, that you can walk into a, a lower elementary, kindergarten, first grade, second grade classroom, and these young people are working with base blocks. They're working with different manipulatives. Literally, a first grader sees with their own hands that the facts and the truths of mathematics are rooted in reality. In other words, they can physically see, they can uh, subtract and add, and they can see place value. They can see number theory literally in their hands. So when someone tells them that math is a human construct and we can decide what we want, that first grader sees right off the top it's rooted in reality. I love that idea. Um, on our Facebook page, if you don't keep track of our Facebook page, I highly recommend it. Um, we're going to stick a, uh, there's going to be a, a, a tutorial video. Marcy uh, Finn, who is uh, the Irving Lower School headmaster, she has a fabulous 20-minute presentation talking about how that, how that program is executed. I highly recommend it. Next thing we go to is we go to Latin. We teach Latin, so we go K through 8. It's a required course, Latin is. People a lot of times say, why Latin? Latin does a lot of great things for us. Number one, it has a, a, a cultural and narrative component, so I describe it. And when we talk about a narrative component, it simply means, uh, you know, Latin, as far as being the, the DNA, the linguistic DNA of the West, it opens up a lot of tremendous um, history, poems, and songs to us. And our students, by learning Latin, get to have access to this in its original language, which is a phenomenal beauty in and of itself. The, sec the second thing Latin does is there's a technical component to it. And Latin's ability to uh, you know, inculcate structure of language and to teach precise thinking patterns um, traditionally has been unexcelled uh, by anything else. So we teach Latin. Uh, once we get up into the junior high and high school years, we'll offer Greek as well as modern language as well. Uh, we'll finish up here talking a little bit about science and the fine arts. The science, we use what's called the core knowledge program, not common core. So we use the, the, the core knowledge program. Uh, that's a sequence, and so we use a number of different types of curriculum authors for that. At the end of the day, what we're looking for is we want science not to, not just to be about inputting into formulas, but science should be about inspiring with awe and wonder this amazing cosmos that you and I get the opportunity, the privilege, to be a part of. Science should do that, and that's what our program seeks to do. Finishing up with our fine arts, our students will sing songs. They'll study music poetry, drawing, art, a full fine arts program. That's a quick tidbit going through our process, going through our program, going through our, our scholastic program. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and have uh, Miss Stanley, if you and Mr. Malone will go ahead and come on up. And so Miss Stanley's gonna talk for a few minutes about our after school program. Mr. Malone's gonna talk a little bit about just the lottery process and enrollments. And then we'll finish up with uh, Mr. Scott Perney if he's here and uh, Ms. Jungberg. And so, go right ahead, guys. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am the campus coordinator for co curricular programs. So, I oversee Athenaeum at their lower school campuses, um, homework club when we get to upper school, um, as well as summer programs. So, kinder readiness, summer camp, um, summer school, things like that. Uh, every day after school, we have an opportunity to provide uh, an enrichment program for our students. So it's not just aftercare, they're not just playing in a gym. Um, we actually have a set schedule each day for um, each grade level. So depending on uh, what grade your student is, it may look a little bit differently. So for example, um, each day the children will come in, they'll bring a snack with them that you've provided. They're gonna have time to kind of decompress from their day a little bit and socialize with their friends. Um, if they're in kinder, they may go right outside afterwards and kind of run out some of the energy that they've built up. Um, or if they're in maybe third grade, you might see them proceed into homework. Uh, we do guide them through Spalding, the uh, phonetic spelling list um, each afternoon. And then um, they have an opportunity to complete any other homework that they may have. Um, we have a curriculum that's based on a theme for each month uh, that's provided by our curriculum team. 
um, and our, we have activities that uh, go along with that theme as well. So sometimes you might see them do a craft or an activity, or sometimes it's a game that they play. Um, it's educational, but it's also a lot of fun. So we're learning fun facts and just having a good time with that. It's not um, stressful or, or graded or anything like that they might do during the daytime. Um, we don't tutor, but we do have a supervised homework time. So um, we can answer kind of simple questions for them, encourage them to find an answer or, or maybe um, uh, rephrase the question for them so that they can understand it a little better. Um, and we also have um, a, an opportunity with upper school where they can do a little bit of prayer tutoring when we get to that level. Um, there are four schedule options available um, to suit your needs. So we have five days a week till six o'clock and we also have Friday only uh, for our early release days when when our teachers go and do their professional development. So um, that's just a little bit about Athenaeum um, and after school and how that works. Um, and I'll be outside at the table if anybody has any questions after the presentation. Um, I'm happy to assist you with that. So, right, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Patrick Malone, the Regional Director of Operations here for North Texas. I want to walk you through the enrollment dates, but first, Real quickly about me, I started with Great Hearts in Arizona way back in 2014. It seems like a long time ago now. And I've been with them for the past seven years. This is my eighth year on Great Hearts. And it's, it's great to see the kids as they grow. I used to teach Latin in kindergarten to fourth grade. It's great to see them as they grow up from kindergartners to now those kindergartners are in sixth, seventh grade. It's just fascinating to see. Anyhow, as far as the enrollment dates go, from now through the December 10th is our open enrollment period. That's when we collect all the applications that we will then put into the lottery. So please tell your friends if they're interested, apply now so that they can get to be in that lottery system. All the applications that we get after December 10th will go at the end after the lottery is run. They'll be at the end of the list. So it's really important that all of the applications come in before December 10th so that we can get everyone in that original lottery drawing. And then in January 12th, we'll run the lottery, and that's when we assign the numbers, one through however many, for all the grades. And it's really important that uh, as we start making those offers after January 12th, that you uh, have your paperwork ready so that we can get you enrolled right away. And we'll just go on a rolling basis at, for January 12th. We'll enroll a group, we'll get everyone registered, and then we'll go down the list and we'll enroll more until our, all of our seats are filled. Sometimes it takes a matter of weeks, sometimes we'll work into the summer depending on how many seats are still available. So please make sure that you apply. We actually have a couple of computers. We have a couple of computers in the back that you can apply now if you haven't already applied. Please make, make use of that opportunity to make sure that you get your name in on this original lottery drawing. Thanks, Patrick. And I'm now going to ask uh, Mrs. Youngberg if she would go ahead and hop up here. Uh, she is a teacher at Irving Lower, and so she's going to talk a little bit about what to expect from a classroom perspective, um, day in the life of a young scholar, kind of what that looks like. So, thanks. All right. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? All right, um, so I am a third grade teacher at Great Hearts Irving. I started as a fifth grade teacher, um, and I, again, similar to many others, did not have a liberal arts, Great Hearts education growing up, public school all the way, and I was in college for um, elementary education, graduated in that did my student teaching at public schools with a little bit of charter school in there and came to Great Hearts. Never really thought I'd be in a charter school or a liberal arts education school, classical education, um, but now I would never leave. Um, it is the best thing ever. <laughs> um, I often get asked why I choose Great Hearts, why I teach this. Well, every single day, we have 30 minutes in third grade dedicated just to literature. We start and finish 
many novels in third grade. In kinder, they start and finish smaller novels <laughs> moving up each year. In fifth, starting and finishing The Secret Garden, um, where the red fern grows, we cry together as a class every year. It's beautiful. Um, the students read out loud each day, hopefully. We have 30 of them, so not everyone gets a chance each day to read about a paragraph. Or we would do small groups, or they would read to their neighbor. Um, it really teaches a love of, of reading, a love of those characters, that development. It's something that you don't get if you're just reading a curriculum book handed down by the state or the federal government. Um, just small stories each day with a general theme. We have nine core virtues that we talk about um, as a class almost every day. They're on our walls, they're in our books. Students come across them and notice them and are taught to act like those characters in the books. Um, that's part of why we choose classical literature and great, great literature is because those characters teach us a lot. And being able to follow that character from the beginning of the story to the end, or in Chronicles of Narnia, following that character Edmund from when he's a little twerp that you want to flick, to mm, he has grown, he has so much responsibility, he's one of our favorite characters by the end. And the students learn that they too can grow and change and develop that strong personality. So, I started with literature because it's my favorite. <laughs> um, we also teach great math and uh, science and history. Currently in third grade, we are on our anatomy unit. We talked about the brain today. The brain is the king of the body, but who controls the brain? You control your brain. Your brain might control your breathing, your heart pumping. Without those things, we would die. But without your brain, without you, telling your brain to read great books and make great decisions. You control your brain, your brain controls your body. In history, we are currently talking about Rome. Rome comes into science as well. We have three kingdom, three ages of Rome and we discuss all of them. And kings, there are many good ones. One terrible one that led to the end of the Roman kingdom. Then we have our Republic, Roman Republic, which is where we got our Republic from, cut and paste almost. Then we move into the Roman Empire, and we learn about emperors and the goods and bads of that as well. History is good and bad, and we teach all of it. We learn from our history. That is the only way to go about it. In math, I'm partial to math as well. I'm currently doing some planning for it. We start with our concrete. The students have manipulatives in their hand, those base 10 blocks or just counting beans, um, 10 charts, stuff like that, so that they see it, they feel it, they sort it, just holding on to those things. Do you know why long division works? Many of you might not. I never learned why division works. I learned, do the steps, you'll get the right answer. We teach our students why long division works. Everything is rooted in place value. And they have to know the why before they can move on because if you're just taught steps, you're not growing your great heart. You're not able to teach anyone else. You just follow the guidelines, follow the steps. Well, we want them to know more than that. We want them to be able to know why. Why is a very important thing. And starting even in kindergarten, why does two plus two equal four? Well, you have two solid things that they're holding. You put them together with two other solid things. Now there are four solid things. They are holding on to those. Then we move on to our Spalding program. I'll try and show you what we do. So like it was said, our spalling program works with phonics. We work with, in kinder, learning our single 
monograms. Mm -hmm. This is the letter V. This says V. Mm. Then, moving on to more, they learn all of their single phonograms in kindergarten and move on to some multi-letter phonograms. This is a tricky one. This is E, I, it. This says E, I, it. It has three sounds. This one says J, just J. It has a Q to separate it from our other sounds that also say J, so that they can learn those. Then we move on to spelling. So our spelling program is not just a list of words that they get on Monday morning and are tested on Friday afternoon. Many schools do that as well. I've seen it, I've taught it, I've done it. Would not go back. So if you were to spell the word manner, which is one of our spelling words this week, manner. I will stand in a scholarly manner. You would say manner. Man, ner. There's two syllables. Sorry, lost my brain. Man, ner. Then they would finger spell. Mm, a, n, n, er. We have a two-letter phonogram, er. I would ask, what er? There are many ers. There's the er of her, the er of first, nurse, works, and early. This is the er of her. M, a, n, n, er. So they are using their sight, they're using their hands, they're using individual sounds, and then we will spell it. And we'll talk about why. Why do we have two N's? Well, if you didn't have two N's, your A would say A, Mainer. That doesn't make sense. So we talk about the specifics of why. And, sorry, I'm like real nervous. I don't talk to adults, I talk to children. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the biggest thing of why I would choose to be a Great Hearts teacher forever is that I have the ability to shape the students in my classroom to not just learn long division, but to learn friendship and learn the proper way to greet someone. In the morning, they come up to me, they greet me, they look me in the eyes. Sometimes that's really hard for students. It's really hard for adults sometimes, but they're taught that and I teach them that with love and encouragement. And if they're not able to do it on the first day, that's okay, we're gonna build up to it. They have recess for K through five at least two times a day, and they're pretty good recesses, even the fifth graders, and they need that time. Um, and it's just, how many schools have nine virtues that they talk about on a daily basis? Honesty humility, respect, responsibility, integrity. Try teaching integrity to a third grader. What does that word even mean, right? So I just think it's very beautiful. I think what we teach is very important. The way we teach it is very important. It's not something handed down from on high that you've got to figure out to teach or just teach it out of the book. We have many many weeks in the summer of teacher training where we go through it as a as a faculty even in my third year we went through it as a faculty we brought in specialists i learned things our teachers are amazing many of them start as tas or ats apprentice teachers or teachers assistants and move on to lead teachers two teachers in every classroom for you guys yes for everyone all great hearts two teachers in every classroom. That cuts the teacher to student ratio in half and is very, very amazing to see. Um, and they are two teachers. They're not just, oh, that's my main teacher and that's the other lady in the back. They are the two main teachers and that is very important to me as well. So I will be around as well and will be happy to answer any of your questions regarding the day and um, I love Great Hearts, I love teaching here, and I 
wish I could give the same education to everyone all over the world. So, thank you. So our last speaker before we hit our Q&A is Mr. Scott Purdy, and uh, he has students here at Great Hearts, and so I'll let him just talk about uh, what it's meant to him and his family, and um, take it away, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'm a Great Hearts parent. I have a son. He's right there. He's in seventh grade. He was doing an Italian tutoring class, and now he's have a seat, I think, and join us. But uh, he started in the first grade, I'll just hold it, with Great Hearts in the beginning of the very first school, the flagship school in North Texas, in Irving. And um, that adventure began, and the reason I'm here is by my own choice, uh, because my joy for Great Hearts is so great. Uh, you put me in front of a group of parents, and I don't have enough time to talk about Great Hearts. But I sat where you sat, or you're sitting now, eight years ago. And in fact, I brought with me, just because I knew I'd be speaking with you, um, a business card from Warren at the Edges, Dr. Uh, Daniel Scoggin, who I didn't know. He was the founder of Great Hearts. And I met him. And I studied classics in college, and I was working with my son on a chief writing tablet, the Greek alphabet, before, before we came to the, to the meeting. And I walked up to Dr. Dan. I heard they were teaching Greek in high school. I said, oh my gosh, look, we're learning the Greek alphabet now. And then later I thought, maybe that seemed kind of weird. You know, I just walked up to the founder of Great Hearts with my chief writing tablet, and he just looked at me and he said, that look, sounds like a Great Hearts student. And uh, that's where my journey began. But um, I just want to say, before COVID, the waiting list at, at our school was about 2,000 uh, families. So you're in a really good place. I was so excited when we had the lottery and I found out we were in, I texted uh, my son's mother said, gosh, we're in. And she said, well, I already found out we're in. I got, I entered the lottery and didn't tell you and guess what we're in, so I got ahead of you. <laughs> so we had fun with that. But I, I just wanna say, um, if I could have had the education of my choice, it would have been a great part of education. And I can't think of anything more important now as we sort of have a stark contrast in the world the kind of choices that we wanna give our kids. It's never been more clear, the lines are stark, of what choice you have to make. And there's no, that's why you're here, right? There's nothing more important. To me, it's a, a sort of generational importance, and that's why I'm here. Because that's beyond just my family. That's the choice I made. But I wanna share with you what Great Hearts did for my family, as well as just to say, it's just, it's so important because Great Hearts offers something that I couldn't find elsewhere. So I had done the public school tour. I'd done the private school tour. I've seen public schools that are teaching some branch of Western civilization, I'm not sure where or what tree it came from. I saw private schools where they just dropped the kids off and it's the parents you know, said, teach my kid and I want a fully educated kid when I get back. The parents were not in a dynamic relationship with the school. I saw charter schools that did sort of information in, information out, you know, like your son's a flash drive and you just dock them at the port and they put the information in. So I said, you know, I want something that teaches the heart. I remember Aristotle said, you know, uh, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Where's the virtue and the character? And so I'll say to you, you know, eight years ago, I began this journey with great hearts. And some of my most wonderful dear friends are here in this room. Mr. Malone, Salway Magister, he was my son's Latin teacher. And my son came home from Latin, and he says, Arma warumque cano. I said, oh my gosh, you know the first sentence from uh, Virgil's Aeneid. And he looked at me like this, and he said, why did you stop me? And he kept going, you know, Troy, I, uh, you know, so he, he did the whole first part of, of, of the Iliad recitation in Latin. And we had so much fun with that. One of our great journeys is etymologies of words and virtue. So around our fireplace, for example, one of the most joyful experiences, I actually brought one. 
We've done virtue cards over the years. This is around our fireplace at home. This is for virtue. Whenever we read a book or one of the classics to keep and we learn something about a character, whether it's Sam the Minuteman in the first grade or uh, where the red fern grows, we, we write the virtue. In this case, it's virtue. Arete in Greek, I had to add my own personal flair to this. In Italian, it's vertu. In uh, Spanish, it's vertu. And in French, it's vertu. So Latin, vertus, doing what is right, not doing wrong or excellent. So we have a number of these cards around. Whenever we read a story, we say, what does that relate to? Which virtue card can we talk about? We have a conversation around that. And I can't think of a greater joy as a father to have with my son than something that it's magic or to talk about where the red fern grows in Billy. A story I read as a child in Oklahoma after it was first published. And I had written the author Wilson Rawls and have the letter still where he said, here's the experience I actually had in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Here's what's true and here's what I wrote in the book. You talk about magical experiences. Now, how many schools will give you that opportunity to engage in that literature experience? I think for, for me at the time, it was really the curriculum answered so many of my questions as a parent. And I have to tell you, uh, once parents find out what Great Hearts is really about, their reputation, their tradition, the quality of the teachers, they're all like-minded kindred spirits. And that's part of it. And I think one thing I would really emphasize to you as well is, as parents, you look for opportunities to be engaged I can have a meeting with David Denton anytime. I don't have to have an attorney present, okay? I don't have to have the approval of the school board. We can have an adult conversation about anything, and they're open. Uh, there were teachers um, at Great Hearts that I've met and are, I consider dear friends. We've worked on projects together. Mr. Malone is, and I have collaborated on several parent-teacher uh, conceptions to improve the school, and we've worked together. We've collaborated. and and we've got other parents involved in the community, it truly has been an extraordinary experience. I didn't plan on being that involved, I'm not normally that involved, but I feel like I'm contrib contributing to what is important, that I think is important in terms of my son's education. So I really encourage you to consider those. If those things are important to you, you're in the right place and you're in uh, your home. So. I think the key part of that I just want to say is parents as stakeholders. If you want an opportunity to be a stakeholder in your child's education and you truly believe that where the rubber meets the road in society today, the most important thing you can do for your child is give them, give them the right kind of education, then you're in the right place. Again, I'm here because I choose to be because I want to look you in the eyes, parents, and tell you my story and why I think it's important. A couple final things I just have to share with you, part of my uh, delight as a parent in sharing experiences with my son. Um, poetry recitations, um, I never thought I could learn poetry again, but I actually can, and we have fun. I have, my son has a platform we've created, it's called the, the living room table, and he stands up there like on a stage, and he recites poetry. and. We keep practicing until he feels comfortable with it, but we have so much fun. Any classic form you want to consider, Great Hearts has so many. Um, that's one of the real delights that I've had. Um, learning about the great stories of history. So for example, I read the Iliad. It's one of my favorite books, but I hadn't read it in probably two decades. And now we're re-exploring the stories of uh, ancient Greece and Rome. And you realize how timeless these virtues are. You, learn your virtues from all of history because the, the heroes of all time have gone before us. And a lot of times it's easy to say, well, what does is, what is ancient Rome have to do with me today? Well, I'll tell you, it has everything to do with us today. Because these are the timeless virtues of mankind that we all yearn for in our hearts as human beings. And great hearts, and you're engaged with your child, you rediscover that. And it's really important. And it's a really important part of the process. So if that sounds like something that that you would really be interested in and yearn for, I really encourage you to get early in the process because again, once the word gets out, usually there's a big rush and then there's a, a line wait. And by the way, I have to make the disclaimer, this, uh, all the content of all my talk is not related to Great Hearts. They don't take ownership of I do, but I always give that disclaimer. So I'll be around for any questions. If anybody would please ask questions as parents. I know you have many of them. 
um, but I really encourage you to do your, your full discovery of great arts, and I think you'll find a, a good pathway to what you're looking for. Thank you. I should have let him just go first and then be done tonight. Okay, as we wrap up tonight, um, what kind of questions might you have? Um, we'll have, uh, there's some tables uh, with tons of information back there as well. Uh, any, any member of the team here, you can uh, go kind of mingle back in the back and in the front. You can ask those questions as well.